it was a failed launch because I didn't make any sales, but it was, I would say it's probably one of my most successful launches because I had all my emails batched. I automated the sales process. I figured out that like the offer isn't positioned properly and how to shift that up. And now I can go and do that. So, so yeah, it was definitely not the launch that I was expecting, but um, I'm really grateful that that's the way it kind of unfolded. Hey, my friend, welcome to the Art of Online Business podcast. My name is Rick Mulready, and I'm an online business coach. I'm an ads expert, and most importantly, I'm a dad. And this show is where we help established online course creators and coaches create more profit, more impact, with less hustle. All right, let's get into it. All right, what's up, my friends? Welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for tuning in, as always. Hopefully you can tell my voice today that I'm so excited about my guest today and next week, actually, because this is a part one. And by the way, we're continuing our membership series here on the podcast. And today we're talking about how to reduce churn and increase retention. And joining me, her name is Diana Tower. And I was introduced to Diana through my diversity, equality, and inclusion consultants, Erica Corday and India Jackson. And they were like, you've got to talk to Diana. She is amazing when it comes to community management and engagement. And so she's a membership community strategist. And Diana specializes in teaching you or your community manager. This is really cool. How to keep members engaged, how to reduce churn and foster a community where people just simply love being a part of it. Diana is also the former community manager for Ramit Sethi before creating a business for herself, helping people around the world. She is super smart when it comes to community management and engagement. She's a ton of fun to talk to. And we ended up talking when in this in, in this initial interview for about an hour and 20 minutes. And I was just taking notes constantly while we were chatting. And we got to the end. I was like, holy cow, this is chock full of tactical things, tactical strategies that you can go and implement right away. And so I decided rather than give you an hour and 20 minutes of so many things that you can go and test that can reduce churn and increase retention and just create an amazing community in your membership that I would break it up into two parts. Part one today and part two next week with Diana Tower. And so today we're going to be talking about how to reduce churn and keep members engaged with Diana. Okay. Now, before we dive into it with her, if you are an established online course creator or membership creator, or you're an online coach, you're already making at least 100K a year in your online business, and you're looking to scale. You're looking to take things to the next level, but you're not really sure what to be doing. You're overwhelmed. You're stuck. Uh, maybe you need to build a team. Maybe you need to improve your sales and marketing or your systems and processes, et cetera. I want to invite you to check out to learn more and apply its application only for our accelerator coaching program. Go to rickmulready.com forward slash accelerator. After I chatted with Diana, I was like, I got to get you to do a private training for our accelerators, which at the time of recording this, she's doing uh, that this coming week during our virtual retreat. And so she's just amazing. So I'm going to stop talking now. Let's dive right into it. Part one here with Diana Tower. So you just had a launch and you're, you're telling me that you, it didn't go quite as planned. No, most would what, call it a happened? failed. <laughs> most people would be like, uh, my launch didn't work because I had my first no sale launch. No <laughs> obviously sales. people, no sales, zero sales. So after I gave myself, I gave myself a moment because obviously we're in, you know, we're, we want sure. to make sales when we launch things. But after that moment, I went into curiosity mode to figure out like, okay, why? Like, why didn't anybody buy? And so I sent out some emails and a survey and it was, I kept getting exactly the same answer, which to me feels kind of like cheating, but everyone was like, man, you know, I just didn't really have time or it was a really quite a high price point. If you just had a pre-recorded program for like 500 bucks, I totally would have bought. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait. What was the program? 
So what was so the, the offer that you went out with? So here's the, the offer. So it was like 12 weeks, live training, lots of coaching, small, intimate group, you know, and the price point was um, $29.97, like full mm. on big dog. Yeah. That's the way I like to roll. I like, you know, full on get my brain into whatever people are working on, lots of support. And yeah, like for community management uh, training. So for memberships, right? So you've got this paid membership. You're either the host that's doing things, wearing all the hats yourself, and you want to do it more strategically, or you want to train your VA or your community manager team member to do that for you. And yeah, it was really interesting. It kind of like I kept getting more and more replies to my emails with the same thing. So then I sent another email saying, hey, someone suggested that I create a pre recorded program. $500 price point. What do you think about that? And that's when people were like, oh my gosh, that sounds amazing. Are you doing it? When are you launching it? Like, so the, the reaction was really positive and it kind of helped me connect dots because mm. I then looked at the industry, right? And I thought, well, let's look at the competitors. What are they doing again? Like, let's go check and see. It's all pre recorded price points, $500 to $750. I'm like, what the? F like, why was I? trying to go this way when this is kind of, this is the ecosystem that was, that I was in. And so it, so like I said, it was a failed launch because I didn't make any sales, but it was, I would say it's probably one of my most successful launches because I had all my emails batched. I automated the sales process. I figured out that like the offer isn't positioned properly and how to shift that up. And now I can go and do that. So so yeah, it was definitely not the launch that I was expecting, but um, I'm really grateful that that's the way it kind of unfolded. This was the first time you've launched this program. No, this is the fourth time I've done this program. So it's always been live and yeah. it's just, it's sort of, I've been doing it with live groups. And so I launched it probably two or three years ago. And then yeah. I did another group and I was consistently getting about 10 people because my audience yeah. is quite small. Mm -hmm. And it just, every time I was doing it, I was getting more feedback. It was really interesting because the, the feedback I was getting was that they wanted more implementation. They wanted more support. So I kept expanding the program and increasing the price. And so yeah. then with this last, um, what was it? Before it was eight weeks and then I shifted it to 12. And then that was kind of, I guess, like the breaking point where people were like, mm, it's not like, it's not meeting their needs. So so yeah, it was just, it's been really interesting. But of course, right now I'm sitting here thinking like, I have the program, it's recorded. I just have to package it up and then deliver it. Why don't it. you so, send them a link, create an order form, price yeah. it, send them a link and say, hey, you asked for it, enroll now and it'll be ready, whatever, November 1st or however long you need it. Yeah. It's a it's very good like a question. Put your, money, put your money where your mouth is sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. It's like you're pre-selling it, essentially. You're yeah. saying, hey, you say you want this, but let's put some money on the table to prove it. And you're totally right. And it's so funny because even like yeah. as I'm sitting here, my brain is saying it's too easy. It's too easy. Well, that's what you told me earlier, right? Because before we hit yeah. record, you're like, I feel like it's cheating. I feel like yeah. it's like, wait, that's quote unquote, all you want is pre-recorded, go through it on your own time, that's yeah. too easy. Isn't right? it so but interesting then if you, that we think that? But if we flip it, like what if it were that easy? What if that's all they really want? They want the training so they can watch it whenever the hell they want. Yeah. And on their schedule, they can binge it in a week or they can set it up, you know, for a six week sort of thing. Yeah. And, and it works on their schedule. It doesn't matter if they're in Australia. There's nothing right. live. It's yeah. all there. So I think it's for and you me, can offer I offer that second tier of yep. coaching and support if somebody wants it. Well, here's the idea. So this is like snowball. I was like, this kind of has shifted my whole business model. So I'm like, okay, well, if I have like, you know, the $500 course, I could then have a coaching membership on the back end where it's like, hey, do you want to have monthly coaching with me? Boom, join there the membership, go. right? Yeah. So it feels like, like I said, it was just really, really a learning launch. So I like, if you're, if you're not, you know, winning, you're learning, right? It's like that, that expression, yeah. you know? And so I really feel like learn a, a lot. All right. So when is the link going to go out? <laughs> when, 
when I are you going to send it? Yeah. When are you going to create it? When are you going to send it out? Well, and when are you going to have the videos ready? We're recording this the first I week know. of October. Right. People, people <laughs> love when I put them on the spot. <laughs> I know, right? Well, let's see. So everything is technically, everything is recorded. It's all in the hub. I'm just splicing it up. So, I mean, where are we? We're in mid-October. I could probably get this done for like beginning of November and like send it out to my list and say, hey, but I can actually know. I think the link to actually pre-buy, notice what I did there. I was like, no, I'll send totally it later. Like, Today is Wednesday. Like, <laughs> this can be done by Friday. You, this, that is honest. true. That is true. And I already technically have the Thrive Cart page made. Oh, <laughs> it's already, zero it's already done. There's, there's zero, zero excuse. Just say, hey, so, I listened to your feedback. So I'm in the process now of of just organizing yeah. the videos in a, in a, I don't know, whatever, in a better way for you. Here's the link. As soon as it's ready, which is going to be this time, grab so your spot right. now. Boom. I'm just going to take that, <laughs> transcribe now, it, put it in my now, email. <laughs> now you're going to have... Uh, you're going to have with this recording here. Now you're going to have a membership on the back end of it. That's coaching. I love the idea. Do you know how to manage that community from a community management perspective? Well, here's the fun part is that I, so right now I actually technically do have, I have a mastermind. So I went, so for my previous versions of the UniU, the program, I launched the mastermind. So it's a high, high end mastermind. It's a smaller group. And so there is community there. I will say that community is, it's much harder to do when it's your own. And I think that this is what actually most of my clients run into. So like when you're the membership owner and you're trying to manage it and wear all the hats, you start to overthink a lot of things. And you also, you're trying to balance. So I talk about like coaching versus community. So this idea that answering questions does not foster connection and community. Okay. Answering questions is coaching. And so this idea that when you're the host, you, you feel obligated to answer questions because you're usually the expert or you're the person that's in there that has the knowledge. And so it can be really hard to balance those hats and to find a way, like, how do I show up as the host and answer questions and coach versus how do I show up as you know a community manager and facilitate the connection between between other members? So if I take myself out of this and I pretend I'm talking about somebody else, it's so much easier. Right? I I didn't know you. I was actually kind of jokingly asking you that question, kind of. Oh, what are you joking? You because this is your expertise and exactly what we're going to be talking about here today. But I'm so glad you bring this up because so many of us take on that role of. Oh, I have this community. I have this membership. I don't yeah. have a separate quote unquote community manager. How do I? It's really hard. Yeah. How do I do that? Yeah. It's really hard. And I can like, speak from personal experience, even for myself. Like, usually I've been the community manager for other people. So I was the community manager yeah. for Ramit Sethi and his coaching membership. Um, I've supported other community managers. So when it's somebody else's baby, it's much easier to really focus in and put blinders on and focus on community and connection. But when you're the host and you're thinking about everything and you're thinking about your bottom line and you're thinking about all the things and somebody asks a question, your knee jerk reaction is to jump in there and answer it. And as a community manager, you shouldn't be doing that. You should be mm. looking to foster connections with other members, helping other members jump in and support other members and facilitating connections and this sort of thing. And so it's something that, that I talk about in my program is boundaries. So like taking a step back and actually figuring out like, how do you want to show up in your community? Do you want to be in there every day? Do you want to be on like on the weekends, in the evenings, like having some structure, having some boundaries to when you're showing up, but also how, like, do you want to, if you're, for example, if you're in a Facebook group, do you want to host a Facebook live once a week and answer questions? Do you want to sprinkle knowledge in the comments? Do you want to not be in there at all? Like, these are all questions that people don't really ask. And so they sort of, like you said, they just jump mm -hmm. in. They're like, okay, cool. I've got a membership. I've got to have a community because people, you know, they come for the content, they stay for the community, but like engage, like do your thing. You know, people just sort of think that people are going to engage and do their own thing. And it can be incredibly frustrating and really draining when things aren't working. 
So when things are a little bit quiet or you're always jumping in and you feel like the engine, but then you don't really know what else you should be doing. There's so much there I want to unpack because this is what you just described is so common for so many people. And I've gone through this myself in the past as well. It's just like, we have, you know, we have this community, we have this membership, if you will. And we feel like our members are expecting us, meaning the creator, the leader, quote unquote, to be the one answering the questions. And we almost feel this pressure of somebody asked a question and, oh, I have to, I have to jump right in and get back to them. Otherwise they're going to be unhappy and then leave. Right. Right. So how do we, instead of that, what kind of mindset should we kind of begin to create for ourselves to have a different approach so that we're not like, oh my God, they're going to leave if I don't do this. Yeah. Well, what I would do first is I would, I would take a step back and I would actually look at the expectations that you're setting. So what expectations do your members have when they join? And so like when I, so we talk about onboarding as well. So onboarding is Mm -hmm. super important because you're setting up the expectations, right? Like what's going to happen here? What, what's going to go on in this community? But when I talk about onboarding, it's not just the emails of welcoming people in. I'm talking about like your sales page. I'm talking about the free content you're sharing and who you're attracting. Like we go all the way back to figure out like, what expectations are you setting? So for example, um, one of the biggest mistakes is people will sell the community as like a coaching platform, right? They say, Mm -hmm. oh yeah, come and get your Mm -hmm. questions answered. Yeah, Come and get direct access to me. And so if you look at the sales page or you look at the, the content that's promoting it, you can see these kind of red flags where it's like, ooh, like you're setting the expectation really high. Whereas you can simply switch that out and say, you know, join this um, amazing space to connect with peers or support one another and not be alone. Like you want to put the positioning or the focus on something that's not, you know, come and get direct access to me. Because another issue with that is that if you have a higher end offer, you start cannibalizing that because you're coaching in your membership and people are like, why would I join your higher end coaching? because I get all my questions answered here. So I'd say, you know, taking a step back and like asking yourself like what are the what's the expectations that I'm setting? And then once you've identified them, asking yourself what do I want the expectation to be? And are they aligned? And if they're not, you have to change them. And this is probably one of the biggest issues and the discomfort that people feel around community is that when you have to change expectations, especially when you're taking something away, people don't like it even if they're not using it. Right. So imagine you have lots of coaching calls and you realize that people aren't coming to five of them and you're like, okay, let's eliminate five coaching calls. Now you somehow have to tell people in your membership that you're removing five coaching calls, even though they're not using it, but you have to find a way to position it that it benefits them and that this is actually a good thing for them. Um, And so, yeah, I would just say focus on positioning things and making it so that it's it's a community. It's a peer-to-peer connection that you're not going to be in there 24-7. You know? And so that's, again, like figuring out your boundaries. Like, how are you going to be showing up? But then also deciding like what you want the space to be and just really presenting it that way. So, okay. So you've set the expectations, like what the community is and is not. I want to go back to... so Because a lot of people... There, especially with Facebook groups, right? And I, I want to kind of circle back to that and get your thought on Facebook groups, especially considering the circumstances of a few days ago at time <laughs> recording this, where everything went down. Um, a buddy of mine was launching, and he was launching in a Facebook group. Uh, that oh, was no. the first morning. But you know, a lot of what you hear a lot of people talk about is like post silly, sort of easy questions for people to answer. So that it's like a one word to kind of create more engagement and kind of play the algorithm a little bit so that more and more content pops up. Now, I want you to kind of like expand way beyond that. And let's define what actual creating engagement in a community and really like managing the community. Like, what does that mean actually in your mind? Yes. Okay. So there's so much. So first of all, like, I think this whole thing of like, yes, no posts, put emoji, drop a GIF, these kind of things, that's sort of like you're sprinkling 
some cheese on top, you know, to Mm -hmm. kind of get Facebook to play nice. Um, I would say that that adds little to nothing in terms of helping your members actually connect with each other. I think as well, just like on the back end of all this, like, so when, when you're looking at managing a community, essentially what you're trying to do is help people kind of let their guard down and feel safe and connect with other human beings um, on the same journey, right? So they're, you know, they have the same goal. Um, But we're also looking at like, in terms of strategy, it's all about emotions, right? So we want to amplify or trigger positive emotions, but we also want to minimize and avoid, you know, quote unquote, negative emotions. Mm -hmm. And so when you're looking at engaging a community, so like, I don't know, like there's this, there's a lot of, like a lot of people focus on numbers. They're like, okay, we like, this is the numbers and we have to hit the numbers and it's all about numbers. I'm not that type of person. I'm like, in terms of approaching a community, I'm much more, let's, let's observe this space and see what people are doing and let's create more opportunities for them to do those things. So it's a little bit more like, for example, like when I approach engagement content, you know, I, Mm -hmm. It's not just what I think and what I like, okay, I'm going to write something. It's actually going into the community and um, looking at posts and observing and kind of breaking them down and looking at, okay, why did this person post this? What emotional, like what emotion is being satisfied? What information is happening? What are other people feeling as they're reading this? And sort of like breaking it into parts. And so actually like I did this on one of my coaching calls once and we looked at um, a community because someone was really struggling. They were like, I don't know how to, like what we should be posting. And we looked at a post and we came up with like 20 different post ideas from this one post that a member had posted. And I think that there's, um, there's a lot of experimentation with engagement and content and people don't like it. So the idea that you have to create something and you put it out there and you see what happens. And you'll see if people engage with it or you'll see if people don't. And so I think that if you want to actually create a space where people like feel something and they actually Mm -hmm. feel a part of your community, you you really need to approach it with like a more human sort of approach. It's not just, okay, we've got to get people to engage. We need to boost numbers. We need to get all these numbers into a certain box. Mm -hmm. It's more, how can we make people feel the way they need to feel so that they will not want to leave, you know, that they'll feel safe and that they'll actually connect with other members. And I think it's, it's something from a business perspective that a lot of business owners overlook. They don't give it a lot of merit because it's very difficult. It's like an octopus, like putting a diaper on an octopus. It's like you do this and it's very difficult to prove that you like you writing this post actually impacted, you know, the bottom line. It's very difficult Mm -hmm. to connect Whereas if you, you know, you change the copywriting on your sales page and you boost, you know, sales by X percent, that's sure. much more, it's easier. So I would, I would say that just in terms of approaching community, it's at least my approach is being very strategic and very intentional, but also just really focusing on like, these are humans, these are people that are trusting you and you're creating this space and you want to make it the best space for them to actually achieve the goals that they want to achieve. That's kind of the, the way I come I, at it. I love that. And I'm just like, just letting that sink all in. Can you share an example of, well, I mean, there's like, I just took notes on like four different things I want to try to try to break down for like example wise, <laughs> but like, what's the example of that one where you, there was, you know, one of your students, they had a post in their community and then you could say, Oh, this is like, 15 or 20 different pieces of posts that you could do to do X or Y. Yeah. So, I mean, like, do you want me to kind of break down the thought process of it or? Yeah, let's do both. Like, what's an example of that type of post that whomever posted there that you could look at and say, oh, that you know what? There's actually a whole bunch of things you could take from that and use to create, you know, whatever connection, safety, et cetera, within the community. Yeah. 
So what I normally will do as well. So like if I'm going to go into a community, so I focus on observation a lot, right? It's mm-hmm. not necessarily that you're taking action. So you're going in and you're just sort of like, what's going on? Like, let's take, you're sort of casing the joint sort of thing. And um, so imagine you have a post that a lot of people are commenting on or they're reacting to. You can see that there's engagement. That to me is like, okay, cool. Like, let's take a look at this post and and try and break it down. And it's it's interesting because I know like my brain moves very quickly. So it's almost like trying to break it down into like a process is sometimes difficult. But I would say that the first thing that I try and do is I look for information. So like, is there information that they're asking about? Like, is what's the question? What's mm-hmm. the answer that they're looking for? So then imagine if um, I believe the person that I, the example I was using before was for photo managers. So they help people organize their photos and do it all online, this sort of thing. And so I think the question was something about like a new system that they were using, or they're asking about a process, or they're dealing with a client and they don't know how to respond. These types of things, first of all, is just like the knowledge, right? So it's like identify knowledge. And so an example of a post that I would, if I were the community manager, I would go in and I would say, hey, um, you know, last week, Veronica posted this really fascinating post and I'm going to trigger the emotions for Veronica, right? She's going to feel like, ooh, I mean, she's getting spotlighted. She has an, depending on the emotional needs, right? Like, so I, we talk about like community vibe. So like, what's, what are the emotional needs of your members? And imagine they want to feel proud of themselves. So I would trigger that a little bit and make her feel proud. Like, okay, Veronica asked an amazing question last week and I would talk about it a little bit and then I might share some information. So it's like, she, she asked this really specific question. And so now here's the thing, my, my knee jerk reaction would be to coach, right? To answer the question, to like provide the information, but that's not the point. The point is to facilitate conversation. So take a step back and say, okay, Maybe there are three people you know that have had this situation happen before. You can tag them in and you're going to be making them feel pretty amazing. Like, hey, I want your perspective, right? Like you, you experienced this before. Wow. You remember that, right? So those people Mm. are going to feel certain things and you're, you're facilitating the conversation. Now you obviously can sprinkle in your own two cents, but you, the purpose of the post is to, to get people talking about that in another post. And then also what's happening is You'll, you'll have witnesses, right? The other members that are seeing, oh, like Dinah's paying attention or the team is paying attention to when these people post. And then she's pulling in all these other people. Like, I want to feel special or I want to be recognized. So then you're going to be encouraging people to perform those actions, posting, answering questions, sharing experiences. And so that would be just one example um, in terms of a post that's related to information. The other really big thing that I look at is for like shares. So when somebody shares something, especially when it's really hard or embarrassing, or um, there's any strong emotion, what I would do in that case is I would then again, highlight that person, really like congratulate them or thank them. Like say, you know, last week, uh, Jason, he shared that he was struggling uh, with clients, with the photo manager clients. And he had this conversation and he shared it here. Here's a link. Three people jumped in and offered some really great advice. Boom, 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 treating those people as well. Um, maybe you missed that post, but let's have a discussion. Let's talk about, you know, when was a situation where you felt frustrated or unheard or whatever, whatever the kind of the emotional side of it is. Again, encouraging people to share and open up because it's not just the people that are sharing and engaging that that you're you're influencing. It's also people that are reading. And they're saying, oh my gosh, like, you know, Rick had the same experience that I had. So even though they're not engaging, it's not measurable. It's not in the numbers. They're having an experience and they're realizing, wow, I really connect with Rick and they don't do anything. And maybe the next time you post, they might reply or they tag you in because they know you've had that experience. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would say it's like, from my approach, at least it's very like organic. It's in the moment. It's like, this is what's happening. What's the emotion or what's the information or what's the common sort of thread that other people can then share or help? This is the other thing too, giving the opportunity for other members to help. So imagine there's like a post and 
somebody is struggling and maybe they're getting some advice, but maybe they're not really getting a lot of advice. Mm -hmm. You can then create a new post and say, hey, John just posted um, yesterday about this situation and it's really difficult. And I know that he's not alone. Like more people have experienced this. I remember tagging in other people, right? But then also inviting other people to share me like, what would you do? So even if the person hasn't experienced it, what would you do if you were John? How would you handle this situation? And so here's the thing, even as I say this, it's like, yeah, but Diana, that's like work. You're asking people to like share a lot and write a lot. And like, you should just go with yes and no. Here's the thing. When you go with yes and no, nobody gives a crap, right? It's like, yes, no, move on. But when somebody shares something personal, something that's hurt or something that's like really inspired them, like that's when people start to feel like, Ooh, maybe I can do that too. Maybe I can share. Maybe I can like feel open and, and, and safe enough to be in this space. And so I think like that's kind of what I do. And then on the flip side, like entertainment and fun. Like if you see inside jokes that happen or somebody makes like, you know, a funny joke or something comes up, like play on that, pull that stuff out. Like when people call themselves different things, right? So if you have a group photo managers and I don't know, like, I don't know, you call yourselves like the clickers. I don't know. There's something like, you know, like a cool name, Yeah. like lean into it and use that because it's like, it's like an identity. They can be like, oh yeah, like we're the uh, clickers is not a good example, but like, <laughs> I, I was like, I was like, oh, let it go. That was off the right off top of your head. Okay, we'll get it. So I'm like sitting here. I'm fa- this fascinates me, right? Like this conversation, just it, I'm so interested in it because I've I consider myself I've never been good at it that as this sort of thing, right? And I have people on the yeah. team, obviously, to help with this, but. One of the questions I was going to ask you, I think you've already answered, is that how do we create that safety, that safe feeling? But you're doing that through everything that you just described. It's kind of like a a benefit, if you will, or a side effect, if you will, of the types of things that you were just talking about. Yeah. And you know, one thing that we do, again, this is not really intentional. I, I think it's just the the people that that we attract into our accelerator coaching program. So in our group, like people share really deep stuff. Like, you know, we had yeah. um, like a lot of births this summer, for example, like, and, you know, and there's people are sharing all that stuff and there's a lot of deep stuff going on that I'm very grateful that people feel safe to be able to share that stuff where it's not all just funnels or, ads or systems or all that stuff go I, I can a see lot of happen. people Please. i know like this is so big because a lot of people are like no this is off topic delete or you know this isn't appropriate or i i think that like community is not created in a bubble like it happens like for mm-hmm. example like i had a no sale launch you bet your I'm going to be going into my me- like into the community that i'm a, i'm a member that i pay and i'm going to be sharing that why yeah. Because A, it's therapeutic and helpful for me. I can process it. But also it gives other people permission to not feel like crap when they have a no-sale launch. And it's like that, I think there's something about empowering people to help other people just by sharing. Like that's the thing too, is um, a lot of people think, oh, well, I don't have a question or I don't have an answer. It's like, well, don't ask a question and don't give an answer, share something. You know, share yeah. something of your experience or what's going on with your life. And I think that it's, I think, you know, life stuff does happen. People have kids or, you know, really horrible things happen or great things happen. And I think that when you allow space for people to actually talk about that, it, it that's where the magic is. That's where, like you said, like people share deep things and like the more people share, the more other people share. And it's, Obviously, the way that you share, again, it's all about boundaries and expectations. The way people share can be constructive and helpful. Um, I think that, you know, obviously having some guidelines in terms of like, you know, like if somebody is having a day, like having some some guidelines on how they can share that in a way that's going to help them and help other members. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that we should be shutting people down and saying, you could only talk about funnels in this space. Right, right. Who wants to just talk about funnels all the time? Like, you know, like, yeah. 
Well, that's the whole thing, right? Because I mean, that's uber, uber important to, to myself and my team and, and our business is that like, look, we're building our business around our life, not the other way around. And stuff yes. happens in life where, you know, maybe you got to step away from the business for a month or whatever amount of time because something happened. Yep. And that's okay because things happen. And so if we don't feel like we've created an environment for people to be able to share those types of things, you just mentioned something there as far as setting expectations, but like, what are some other ways that we could do that to be able to create that safe environment, if you will, or show people within our membership or in our community that it's okay to to share those types of things? Yeah, I think that And this, for example, like if your membership is maybe newer or maybe it's like it's cricket town and it's really Mm -hmm. quiet and it's probably one of the most painful and frustrating situations where you're like, I just want people to post and you just desperately want to do things. And so the number one thing we tend to do is we start jumping in and we start doing all the things. And obviously, in some cases, we do need to do that. We need to jumpstart the conversation. But in the way that I was talking about before, not ask me all the questions you want, or, you know, let me help you like the coaching, right? We try to save people with coaching. And so what I would say is you want to experiment with, with content. And so obviously if you have a, if you have a membership and there's content, like people are posting, observe what they're doing and do what I was talking about before, kind of observe and pull it apart. But what happens if they're not posting? Like you're not getting that inspiration this is the very uncomfortable reality is that you have to create content and experiment. You have to have a hypothesis that this is going to land and you put it out there. And if nobody cares, you're like, all right, cool. That didn't work. Move on to something like something else. And so, I mean, even as I think of that, I would take it, like take it the same way as a content strategy for say your, your Instagram or for your blog or whatever it is, you might have um, different buckets, right? So you might have something that's focusing on how to, something that's focusing on stories of clients, something that's focusing on wins or different content buckets or types. And to start testing those, seeing like, for example, if you spotlight a member, See if that is interesting, if people have questions for other members, you know, or maybe it's sharing something that you've experienced and then trying to connect it to to their experience. So, for example, myself, when I in my mastermind, it's a new membership. So I work with established membership owners. So a lot mm-hmm. of my experiences are it's, it's like this is new, <laughs> you know, right, and right. so you have to look for a way to kind of connect the dots and say, this is what I'm this is what I'm experiencing. Here's a story. And then look for the connection to, to what they're experiencing. And even something else that has been really helpful as well is just sharing stories of what's going on in your life, but then connecting it to the content or the situations that they're working on is amazing. So like, you're like, I was just at the grocery store and there was this old guy and he was saying, you know, and then suddenly it goes into, this is just exactly what happens when you're selling X, Y, Z. Like you take real stories because people actually are like fascinated. They're listening. Mm -hmm. They're like, you know, stories. And so it's like, I find that like, I just, when I'm out and about, like something will happen or somebody says something or I see something and I suddenly get like, Ooh, this could be like a really good a good, like, for example, I was making homemade bagels the other day you and were? I was shaped. I was, That's have you ever scary. made homemade bagels? No, that, it's, it's very impressive. A, it's a very labor intensive. So, it, but they're amazing. Definitely worth it. Okay. But I had just boiled them. I was doing the sprinkly, you know, everything bagel thing. And I'm just uh-huh. sprinkling, I'm shaking like nobody's business. And then boom, the lid of the jar falls oh, off and all the bagels go all, it's just like this. And I'm just like, you know what I did? I kept holding it. I grabbed my phone. I took a picture and I was like, I don't know when I'm going to use this, but this is going to be a story. It's going to be on like either Instagram or it's going to be in my group. It's going to be something. And it was the funniest thing because normally I would just be like, oh my God, like it's everywhere. But the first thing I thought was this is a story and I can Mm. use it in a different way. So I think Use story, like the stuff that's happening. Like I'm sure there's like five stories from today in your life that you could connect to help your members. 
Yeah, that's something that I don't do a very good job at for sure. Mm. And I, I'm starting. And as soon as you were you were saying, I'm like, yeah, like I need to start thinking like that more. Like the, I was thinking just as you're saying that, I was like, okay, what happened in the past day or so? And I was like, oh, we had like an actual thunderstorm here in San Diego the other night. It was a pretty decent thunderstorm. I love thunderstorms growing up in the Northeast here in the States. And like, I was like, Maya, look, you know, she's going to be three in December. She'd never experienced a thunderstorm. And so I brought her out in the balcony. Uh, we have a little, ba- little balcony on her house and she was enamored with it because it started to rain really hard. Um, and she was watching the lightning and stuff. And then as the storm got closer, the lightning was coming further down towards the ground. I said, okay, it's time to go in. And yeah. she had a complete and utter meltdown because, <laughs> you know, there, in her mind, there's no difference between, you know, mommy and daddy are telling her to go inside versus we need to go inside because it's unsafe out here and we're, you're holding on to this metal railing. You know, and so I don't know. Yeah, that's okay. But this is the thing. You know what's happening for me and everybody else that is listening right now. Everyone was like, just listening. What's happening next? He just took his kid outside, and then there's lightning. And oh, it's our brain just is captivated. And so then you just need to transition. You just need to okay, cool. And this is this reminds me of when we talk to customers and they don't understand X Y Z, or when you have a situation with someone and. For example, like managing a community and you have a member who is like losing, losing their a little bit about something and yeah. you have to manage that. You can totally connect the stories because it's all about emotion. Yeah. All right. That was just part one, my friend. Coming up next week, we've got part two in this mini series with Diana Tower. We're going to continue the conversation all about how to reduce churn keep members engaged and increase retention in your membership. Hopefully by now you're like, holy cow, Diana is amazing. And she is, like I said before, after I had that initial conversation with her and this interview, I was like, I got to get you to come do a private exclusive training with our accelerator coaching members. And when I'm recording this, we're doing exactly that. Uh, coming up in the coming week here for our two-day virtual retreat, which is going to be, people are so excited about hearing from her because she's so good. I I just so enjoy. I think you're going to hear a lot more from her here on the podcast. That's just a little teaser for you. But yes, part two coming up next week. Again, if you are an established online course creator, maybe you've got a membership or you're an online coach, established meaning you're already doing at least 100K a year in your online business, and you're looking to scale, you're looking to take things to the next level and increase profit, increase your impact with less hustle. If you're wanting to do those things, but you're feeling stuck, you're not quite sure what to do, maybe overwhelmed, then our accelerator coaching program is for you. To learn more and apply, it's application only. Go to rickmulready.com forward slash accelerator. All right, my friends. Thank you so much, as always, for tuning in today. Super appreciate you. Again, part two with Diana coming up next week. Until then, be well, and I'll talk to you soon.